Welcome back, all you fabricants and flesh bags, to the super not funny show reviews. I am Mo de Poupay, your friendly neighborhood fabricant and commenter extraordinaire on all things pop culture. Today, I'll be giving you my thoughts on the latest episode of Clarice, coming to you from CBS and streaming on CBS All Access. And this is episode two, entitled Ghosts of Highway 20. Was it good? Was it bad? And should you be watching? Let's find out, because I have some opinions about things. You know, going into this show, I really wondered, how can Clarice maintain the premise of a profiler that goes after serial killers? Because, you know, while I loved Hannibal, it just had way too many serial killers to be believable. I mean, for real. New ones were popping up left and right doing all sorts of dramatic things in the same geographic area. Didn't really make a lot of sense, but they made it work and it was cool. Well, you know what? Clarice kind of sidesteps that uh, in this particular episode. And I would assume, you know, future episodes, if this show is going to more or less start to fit into the mode of a police procedural and... You know, I, I figure it's a police procedural with a big flavoring of Silence of the Lambs slash Hannibal. Uh, but they do so in this episode by showing their, uh, showing that her skills as a profiler are more useful than just tracking down serial killers. And can be used in, you know, more mundane or less, you know, not as mundane, but still not as, you know, dramatically uh, out, out of there, out there, stuff like tracking a serial killer. So in this episode, you know, we're still in the nineties and, you know, maybe, maybe younger people don't remember this, but the nineties were fraught with, you know, fringe militia groups that were always having all these guns and standing off against the FBI. I mean, Ruby Ridge and Waco were big things back then. Um, so in this particular episode, we have yet another fringe military militia group, uh, who call themselves the statesmen. And, you know, an ATF agent is shot trying to serve a warrant on their property. And therefore, the FBI is called in. And at the Attorney General's be you know, behest, VICAP, um, the organization within the FBI that is sort of the Attorney General's, you know, hand-picked group, you know, they get called in to deal with the situation to show that they are viable in all situations. We find, though, that after the events of last episode, that Clarice is sort of a persona non grata within the team because, you know, she went rogue um, talking about what happened with the previous so-called serial killer. And like she was supposed to, she was supposed to say it was a serial killer, but she says opposite in this episode. I mean, at the end of the episode to the press. <clears throat> Therefore, her boss, Krendler, is looking to get rid of her, not just because she went off, uh, you know, off the reservation, but because he talked to her doctor and there's some, I think, you know, reasonable worry that her PTSD is going to be an, a liability in the field. Beyond that, uh, the rest of her team is also looking at her, you know, sideways kind of suspect because she went off, you know, disobeyed orders. And they also are worried that the you know, the work is messing with her mental, you know, her ability to deal with the job. But all that being said, she still gets pulled into a central role in this whole situation because when they arrive, you know, a chance encounter with a, a boy that is, in, you know, in the compound leads to the leader of the cult, a man named Novak, demanding to negotiate only with her because she's the famous Clarice Starling. So she goes inside the compound, hoping to use her profiling knowledge to get to know the man better and end the situation without any bloodshed. Little does she know that he is also trying to profile her. So you know what? This isn't the first time we've ever seen a premise like this from a show like this. And, you know, even though it has a few twists and turns that are quite interesting, I'll say, uh, at the end, the story isn't exactly a surprise. I can say without, 
you know, I can say with that, I'm not saying this to say I'm really smart or anything. I'm just saying I watched it and I pretty much pin more or less where things were going pretty much before, you know, before she even really stepped into the compound itself. I more or less pinned sort of where it was going. Um, did that bother me? Absolutely not. I'm the sort of person that likes the journey as much as I like the destination, maybe even more so. I can know more or less where something is going and still like what, how it gets there. <laughs> so, you know, we find Novak, you know, as the leader of a traditionalist militia, traditionalist, you know, traditional women's roles, men's roles, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. Um, and, you know, Novak, is, he's, he's more or less and they are more or less what you think they are. Um, which is to say that they're mostly full of shit, and also they're you know pretty dangerous in their small little area. There's a bit of mystery as to what's really going on, and you know identifying who shot the agent, uh, all of which serves to show how Clarice Starling has great instincts, has you know deep knowledge, and she has the courage uh, that it takes to be a an officer, you know, an agent. And you combine all of those to make her an agent with the definite ability to get the job done. Well, in, in other words, they are sort of saying in this episode that her victory over Buffalo Bill as a trainee wasn't, was not a fluke. Uh, moreover, you see that she is really sort of, you know, a crusader of sorts who really believes in doing what's right and getting to the truth. And... You know, her, her clear moral compass runs up against, a, you know, the political realities of the situation that sort of muddy the outcome away from maybe what she thinks it should be. And so it becomes a real question as to whether she, and how long she can make the compromises to stay on the job. So all that said, um, you know, again, fans of network TV this is going to be stuff you're, you're used to, fans, not people that are not fans of network TV. I think you'll find it's very surprising. This, What I'll say about this episode and this show so far, it looks more cinematic than, say, an Equalizer or you know Hawaii Five-0, Magnum PI, that sort of thing from CBS. It doesn't quite look like uh, a CBS show so much as it lo- may look like a little bit of prestige TV. Um, and this is all, you know, the cinematography, the direction, it's all there. Um, but unfortunately, it sometimes does get mired in the trappings of police procedurals. What I do like is that all of the the focus on the you know the interpersonal conflict, the professional conflict between Clarice and the rest of the team, but also showcasing something about you know the characters themselves. Particularly, we see so far Esquivel, who sort of ingratiated himself with Clarice, but also her boss, Krendler, who seems like a hard ass and has it out for her, but he also seems to be the good guy that really actually wants to get the job done, and he wants to get the bad guy, and it's nice to see that maybe grudging respect may grow out of this. We also see, again, the politics of everything, how maybe the most good that can be arrived at is not necessarily throwing one guy in jail but having one guy throw many guys in jail. It's something, uh, um, you know, a bit of a moral quandary. And it's nice to see that Clarice can be self-aware enough to know she messed up and let her, you know, her emotions get the better of her and that she maybe should play this game a little better. And it's something I really, really want to see. There's other really interesting parts to this show. Just, I just think that, if this is the you know the villain of the week sort of storytelling we're going to get, it's going to be very satisfying. And maybe this isn't Silence of the Lambs, but I don't think it's trying to be Silence of the Lambs, to be honest. It's trying to be the Clarice Starling show. And to that end, so far we're getting to see who she is, what she's about, and who the people she's around are about, and how they can be effective at being FBI agents that get the guy, get the bad guy. So, well, that's my thoughts you know i think you really should go watch it check it out give it a chance it's pretty great um and i'm enjoying it so did you like my review um if you did please leave a comment down below or you can hit the like button i would really appreciate that um and of course you can always hit me up on email supernotfunnyshow at gmail.com 
And you can go on Twitter at SuperNotFunnyS1. And I'd love to hear from you about this episode. But that is all my spoiler-free thoughts for the moment. And, of course, we're going to be back next week for Clarice Episode 3. So I hope you can join us then. Um, But until then, if you want to get away from these spoilers, I just want to say thank you for joining me and get on out of here. And we'll see you next time. They gone? All right. It's spoiler time. All right. Not a huge amount of spoilers on this. The great thing about, you know, week to week stuff is, um, I guess if you're not used to a network TV like this, you know, there is a long running thread going through, but there's going to be fewer of those than in, say, a Netflix show. So the spoilers aren't that, aren't that, you know, hard to, to roll through. Um, a lot of this is about trust, earning trust, you know, who has trust. There's a great, the scene at the end where she ends up ending the standoff and get, getting the bad guy and knowing that she can trust Escavel to take the shot and make the shot. Um, even though it's a traumatic th- shot thing to see someone get their, you know, head blown off is, you know, it was pretty, it's pretty good. It's, it's good stuff. Um, I think, of course, we know we've seen that that relationship with Escavel was going to be there. But also, I really love the fact that Crindle, uh, Crindler, excuse me, really sort of backed her play. You know, even though she went rogue again, of course, you know, going rogue, but she went rogue again and it paid off and he backed her play on that. And that's good to see. They have her back and she just has to show that she has their back. But I think he's right about the PTSD. Um, and I think, you know, as a counterpoint, she's right about how the job itself does affect other agents besides her. And when she says, I'm good, you know, maybe she is good. I did like how the <laughs> uh, the leader, Lucas Novak, uses his skills you know of course he's he's full of shit he's talking about he's getting women clean off drugs and all that crap but you know he's really just using them for prostitution and keeping them drugged up but you know like any good pimp he has some you know he he's got mind games as they say and he knows how to play them on women and he sees you know he sees uh starling as another mark if you will but you know you gotta leave this shit to a professional and the way she totally turned all that shit around, that whole stuff talking about the mean soda jerk who's a coward, that cowers before her dad, the sheriff, you know, and pointing out he was it and that the sheriff that was he was in cahoots with. Of course he's in cahoots. I literally saw that. As soon as I saw the sheriff, I was like, oh, this guy's totally in on what the fuck is going on, actually going on here, you know. But she, you know, uses the comparison and gets him to tell on himself. And then, you know, of course he gets shot, but, you know, that's his problem. But... You know, he's, he has shows all the signs and her ability to profile that, to really look at and see who this person is, why they're doing what they're doing and how they maintain control. It was nice. It was interesting to see. And also, as I said, sets the tone for how the rest of this show is going to be, because I'll be damned if I watch this show and there's a fucking serial killer every fucking week. No, not at all. But if they do stuff like this, I'm with it. Uh, she's got to be more useful than just tracking down, you know, five or six serial killers, you know, every few, every, you know, five, ten years. Ridiculous. Um, they raised some questions about, you know, things in Clarice's past that I'm really interested in getting to see. Like her dad being a cop and dying on duty and how that affected her family and, you know, her brother, all that stuff. Stuff we didn't know about. I'm, I'm interested in seeing how that plays out later on. Uh, down the road, it's clearly it's going to come up again. Um, there was interesting going back to Novak, you know, again how he plays these little mind games, how he shows sympathy for Buffalo Bill, and it's very interesting take, um, and I think a correct take about how someone feels they have to go to such an extreme, such a horrible extreme, just to be accepted as who he is. Um, very interesting look at it. You know, I don't know if this is an Alex Kurtzman thing. But, you know, having strong women characters, I like that. Um, It's kind of weird to me, though, that he has them going rogue at all times. All these times, they're always going rogue. Um, I hope that's not, you know, 
a I hope that's not a trend. I did like that Clarice followed her instincts, but you know what? You know, sometimes you got to get with the program too. We'll see. Um, I do like how she's handled herself under pressure. She's a tough, tough bird, as they say, and she proved herself. She's she thinks she's not ready for the field. I think she's absolutely ready for the field, and that's why Krendler rescinded his request that she be transferred. All the all the dirty politics, though, and this this is kind of the thing that I I keyed in on at the end of the episode. All the dirty politics, uh, making compromises on one person to get more people, and that's kind of at the heart, the root of a lot of law enforcement. That big small fish can get big fish, and the sort of talking that they that you know letting one guy go can net a whole bunch of other fish, and it's it's tough for her to swallow, but. I think Clarice is a smart person and she realizes, you know, that's this is a compromise that has to be made. But at what price your soul is the question. And she, can she be satisfied with an incomplete victory when someone that is guilty is walking the streets? Time will tell. We shall see more going forward. Either way, that's my spoiler f- thoughts of the episode two called The Ghost of Highway 20. I really enjoyed this episode. Looking forward to more. Um, Well, what do you think about my review? I would love for you to leave a comment or you can hit the like button down below. I'd really appreciate that. Of course, if you're not subscribed, hit that subscribe button. Be subscribed and hit the notification bell so you'll know when we drop new content on the Super Not Funny Show. Of course, we are always talking about movies, TV shows, video games, comics, etc. All that pop culture goodness because that's what we do here. Uh, on the Super Not Funny Show. Well, join me back here next week for my review of Episode 3 of Clarice. I uh, appreciate you being here with me. All you fabricant the flesh bags. I, of course, am Mo De Fupe, your resident fabricant and commenter extraordinaire on all things pop culture. And I will see you guys on the other side of the thread. Peace! <laughs> Thank you.